from the Office of Graduate Research at Flinders University. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research and the Professor of Cultural Studies at Flinders University. And welcome to this podcast on book chapters. And the reason why we're talking about book chapters is I'm about to start between now and Christmas a series of vlogs for my PhD students at Flinders on book publishing, article publishing, really the nature of getting writing disseminated. But as always, there was a particular sideline that I wanted to talk about with Professor Steve Redhead, the Professor of Cultural Studies at Flinders University, to provide a little bit more advice for students on what I think is quite an interesting area for students early career researchers and indeed senior scholars to consider because I think the book chapter is changing in the digital age. So hi Steve. Hi Tara. And Steve, book chapters are often I think underplayed in research. When I was doing leadership, in fact you were doing leadership in the RAE, the REF and in fact in the ERA, often book chapters are seen to be sort of a, a sub-sub, mm. are seen to be sort of undecided, not terribly important. And if you can get a refereed article out, that's always better. And that was always the assumption, really, for the last 15 to 20 years. Mm. But is the status of the book chapter changing? And I'm saying even in the last two years. I think it is. I think there's no doubt there was a snobbery, an academic snobbery mm. around mm. book chapters. But actually... There's all sorts of forces driving this, but I think it has changed. And, I mean, just personally, I've been asked over the last few years um, to write chapters for books, which are absolutely superb, by the way. Mm. Um, and even I had been sniffy about it, uh, about, what you know, why should I do this when I can actually spend time, you know, writing an, a refereed article or part of my book. And, in fact, I've learned a great deal about that change through having to to sit down and write chapters for excellent books. And I've been so pleased. It's, made, it's challenged me. Um, and I think the quality of those edited collections, certainly that I've been involved in, in uh, areas like uh, digital leisure studies, digital football cultures, um, realist criminology and so on. And in, I would say in the last three or four years for me personally, but it's still continuing. It's stuff that I've been commissioned to write for the next two years, for example. A lot of that is book chapters in what are going to be excellent, really impactful um, creative books. That's amazing. So digitisation, and you haven't quite intimated into digitisation, so let's go there. Digitisation through publishers like, say, Elsevier and mm. Springer, that both of us have had dealings with. I've had a lot more, I think, dealings yes. with the new at the moment, but you're about to hit Springer quite heavily, I think. Mm. These publishers have had an impact on book chapters. What's the impact of digitisation on the book chapter and the writers of book chapters? Yeah, there's no doubt that that's one of the main forces, I think. Uh, publishers themselves have seen the, the book chapter as a, a major new thing and they can slice and dice and, that, and they can sell off. So just, just the, clarify that for students. So what does slice and dice mean? Well, they can, they can sell off in, in, in an e-book, for example, chap, you know, a single chapter or Got a couple it. of chapters and the students themselves can then buy those chapters rather than the whole book. I think that's become a major thing. I remember, in fact... When I wrote We Have Never Been Postmodern, which was 2011, that came out as a hardback book. But Edinburgh University Press, who were publishing it, immediately published a ebook version and then pushed the selling of the individual chapters. And I realised at the time, this was about four or five years ago, that the importance of that. And then that's transformed itself not just to a single monograph book, but actually the edited collections. And the great no doubt that, that digitisation is a major force. It's a huge force. And what I would say to students as well, and also colleagues who haven't perhaps worked with Elsevier and Springer mm. in the last mm. couple of years, is when you're writing book chapters for them, book chapters for them, uh, in, in a book, and even a, I've written single authored scholarly monographs, mm. they ask that each individual chapter has an abstract. Yes. So that they and keywords, yes, and keywords. Yep. Each individual book chapter, so they can actually slice and dice. Yes, they can market it. So the the book chapter is not invisible between cardboard covers anymore. No, that's what it used to be. And yeah. and when we had our snobbery, oh look, you won't get many citations mm. from a book chapter. 
that really is gone now if you're digitising the book chapter. Yeah, and again, another area, and I mean, it's still basically the same thing. If you look at the Routledge handbooks, you know, Leisure Studies, Football With Studies, wonderful. Sport and New Media, I've been involved in all of those. You've been involved in the uh, Routledge Handbook of Physical Culture Studies, for wow. example. They are a major operation, and they are big volumes with many different chapters written by some of the best writers on the planet in the different fields. They're fantastic. They're very often selling to libraries, of course. They're hardback in the, f- in the first place. But there's also, you know, there's e-versions of those and, slice and dice, slicing and dicing can ha- happen there. But I think that's quite a significant publishing event. Yeah, Palgrave have done the same. And it does lead to my next question, but I would also just note for students there, if you do get a chance to be involved in one of these landmark books, so these books that are, if you will, a capital letter yep. that starts a field yep. or a full stop that finishes one and starts the, the, the next field, yep. these disciplinary shakers and movers, yes. they often are now happening through edited books. So everybody gets together, there's 50, 60 authors some of the best writers on yep. the planet, that all get together to build a new interdisciplinary field. Yes. So if you're asked to be involved in one of those, bite their hand. Absolutely. Off. And I think the thing is that at the same time as all of these things that we've just been talking about have happened, particularly academic journals have become gatekeepers. Ooh. You've got the open access thing on the one hand. Which we know, believe in very strongly. Huge, um, excellent... <laughs> Excellent journals, which are not gate ke- gatekeepers anymore. The more standard academic journals have become um, they've become atrophied in many ways, in many disciplines. Um, and you, you've got partly through the gatekeeping, you haven't got the innovation. Actually, where the innovation's happening is in either open access journals or book chapters. Isn't that fascinating? Edited because collections. proper academics are doing proper academic work in open access journals yep. and through these really innovative book collections, yeah. which, of course, publish, publishers can now take risks on because they're able to slice and dice yep. it and make their money back easier. Yep. That's the other thing for That's students right. to That's right. So about. there's some really interesting changes going on there, and they are recent. They are. So, Steve, what would you recommend to PhD students when considering book chapters? Because between now and Christmas, I'm going to present to our students through these weekly vlogs all sorts of options that are available to them, yeah. what the different services mean, what open access is, the directory of open access, and particularly I'm going to look at services where there are calls for papers yes. or calls for book chapters. Yeah. So what would you recommend to students when considering that in terms of their time? Yeah, I think they're in a good position, actually, interestingly enough, because they are now able able to make choices that they weren't able to in the past. And, and I certainly think, as I say, the, the new era of book chapters and, and the way that we've described it is well worth getting involved in. And certainly if you're asked, definitely do it. Yeah, because that's the other thing too. They're often windfall-type uh, scenarios and opportunities, aren't yeah. they, Steve? Yeah, because they are. Because they're not quite on the area you would write as a refereed article no. coming from independent scholarship. So it forces you to extend yourself a little bit, yeah. find another interdisciplinary connection. I'll just give give students one example that's hit me recently. As most of you know, I'm a big Doctor Who fan, but also I do a lot of work on popular cultural studies. And I've been working on through much of this year a major article on uh, Doctor Who, particularly Doctor Who fandom and Peter Capaldi mm-hmm. fandom and slash fiction and fan fiction. And so that, that will, I'll finish that over the Christmas break. Mm. And so I've been working on that for the year. But colleagues at a French university contacted me and made this an open call as well for all sorts of people to be involved in a book chapter, a book and, a, and produce a book chapter on 20 years after Henry Jenkins wrote the ACA fan concept. Right. So the ACA fan, the academic fan. Mm. So, of course, I have had to read all the stuff on fan fiction yes. and the ACA fan to write my project on Doctor Who. Yeah. And I suddenly realised, oh, look, I can actually tweak that. I've done all that work. Mm. I can repurpose it for a different piece. I get another singly authored book chapter from research I was doing anyway, but it's doing something I wouldn't have thought of yes. doing without that book chapter yeah. Uh, suggestion and scenario. Yeah. Really powerful, yeah. I think. So, Steve, you've described uh, accelerated culture through your Virilian work as a post-book age. But is that situation changing, really? So 
are we dealing with a new scenario or situation where PhD students are now able to produce their PhD as a scholarly monograph? We've done podcasts in the past. We're saying, guys, look, it may not end up a book. Most PhDs don't end up a book. But I wonder if the scholarly monograph is now becoming an option for PhD students more than in the past. Yes, I was being slightly ironic. Yes, I know you were. When I was talking about the post book. But actually... I did mean it. I think one of the effects of what I call accelerated culture, certainly in the university systems globally, is that everybody's t- chasing their tail. So that the idea of taking you know, a few years off and writing a book, yeah. say 80,000 words up, yeah. um, is actually going in many ways. Partly be- I think it's partly because um, you know, in some ways we're running out of ideas, you know. A lot of the books have been done. But it's actually the case that, especially with edited collections coming on board in the way that we've described, it's easier to take a bit of time to do the research, then write 5,000 words chapter in a book, than write an 80,000 word extended book. And particularly because a lot of these things are collaborative, you know, very often, in many disciplines anyway, people are writing together for journal articles or chapters in books. Yes. Um, the idea of the book, you know, written by one person, uh, is is some in in something of decline. So, I w- even though it's been ironic, I think there is something about accelerated culture eating up the book. But in fact, the chapters in books have now become important in a way that maybe books were for academic promotions in the yeah. in the past. So, actually, writing a chapter in a book, particularly one if it uh, uh, if it's going to be influential the book and the chapter, then maybe you know, the book gets put on the back burner. And I think the interesting thing is that in some ways in the global university system, it's the PhD students yeah. um, who are writing book-length material. They're putting it in as a PhD. But then quite often those, and I've examined some recently, where I said, look, these, these are books. You just need to put them in as books. Yeah. PhD Great, absolutely brilliant. But really, with a little tweaking, this is a monograph and should be published. But actually, they're the people, the PhD students, by force, are having to spend the time, three years or whatever, writing a book-length text. And that that then can be published as a book. But a lot of other people in global academia, because they're chasing their tail, can't write the book anymore. Exactly. And one thing I would say, why you and I have been so staunch against the PhD by publication, yeah. not the PhD by prior publication, we have yep. enormous respect by for publication. that, by publication, yeah. is because, I mean, standards are slipping. I think it's a dumbed-down thesis. And There's I stand no like that. question. I get That's so- one of the global scandals. It's one of the global scandals, PhD by publication. And we've, you know, where this is getting to the point now is people are even questioning, like, Five uh, five articles co- co-authored with supervisors. Five articles. Absolutely. And, and I had a crazy situation. To it. Can I say Flinders University doesn't have a PhD by publication? Mm. Our standards are high. But I was dealing with a colleague at another university who was talking about a PhD by publication this week. Three refereed articles co-written with supervisors. That's now, what I end. would say to students is they're getting flattered, I think, yeah. when academic staff, their supervisors say, oh, look, five refereed articles, that will make that a, a PhD. Mm. And then you've already got five refereed articles. What no one tells students is this. Write a thesis, write 80, 85,000 words, and you'll get eight articles out yep. of it. Eight, nine, ten articles. Yep. You'll get five or six directly, just chapters become, but also it becomes the springboard for the next piece of yep. work. And Steve, as you've said, if you write it as a proper PhD should be, mm. then you can actually make that directly into a scholarly yep. monograph. Yep. Now, it might be the only point in your life where you will have a chance to concentrate for three years on something. Mm. The rest right. of your life, you're going to be getting up early in the mm. morning, trying to you know, hammer out two hours of work yeah. and then go to work. Yeah. Now, for three years, you're able to concentrate and write a proper book. Yeah. So why would you stop yourself having that opportunity and getting referee, you know, five refereed articles out, mm. which you're going to get hundreds out through your career. Refereed articles aren't hard. Mm. They aren't hard. No. Getting the book out, that's hard. That's now, hard. Now, have I been yeah. too, too staunch? No, yet? definitely not. No, I agree with you. 
you know, and so therefore what I would say when people are thinking, oh, I'll do a PhD by publication because publications is how you get jobs. Mm. It's like, of course it is, mm. but get the words on the page mm. and then you can get eight, nine, ten refereed articles out and probably a book as well. Mm. Great example, we'll just use the wonderful Mick Winter, one of our mm. students, PhD students. He's getting two books out of his PhD, yes. a trade book and an academic book. Yes. So don't underestimate this. Final question. So Steve, should PhD students consider the importance of that singly authored book chapter and indeed building on what you've been talking about so far today is the book chapter really the new book i think in many ways that is what's happening for for all of the sort of reasons we talked about from digitization through to accelerated culture i think the one thing i would say about peer students is that obviously you, what you're wanting to do is produce something of quality and I think the best PhDs, they're going to be original contributions to knowledge, but they are also going to be book-length texts. Yeah. And as we've said today, the, the, um, the erosion of time for university academics and for uh, postgraduate students means that you're not, as you said, not very often in your life no. going to get the time to write for three years a text of, of book length. Yeah. Um, and increasingly, it seems to me that that's going to be, you know, the idea of leisurely writing um, an academic book which gets published by Routledge or Palgrave or Springer or whoever it is, th those days in some ways are going. Gone. And the chapters in books, especially with the good collections, sort of things that we've been talking about in our own experience, um, which have really been innovative and creative certainly in my case in the last few years, I've been really excited and inspired by being involved with people's work that I didn't know, should have known, and uh, I bounced that off my own work. And that's because it's been um, really interesting to work in a chapter in a book in a very good book collection, uh, edited collection. And I think it's a really good point. It is increasingly at the cutting edge, the forefront of knowledge, yeah. and we are meeting new people, new scholars. I had, the, I had the great privilege of writing the afterward to the physical cultural studies Fantastic reader. Book. Can you imagine? Yeah. And the legendary Mike Featherston is yes. writing the introduction. Yeah. So, again, it's a great example, and I have enormous credit for colleagues that have given me that opportunity to do Fantastic. that. It's an incredible experience. So, at the cutting edge of knowledge, this is where the new, interesting people and ideas are emerging. Yeah. And finally, Steve, I would actually, and we'll do specific vlogs on this for my PhD students, and obviously that's available off uh, the Office of Graduate Research, Flinders University YouTube channel for colleagues that would like to follow us there. But I'm going to particularly also focus on this small book too, Steve, because yes. the Springer Brief, all the publishers now are coming up, Rutledge as well, yeah. coming up with the short book. Yes. So if, for example, you write three chapters on something, that's now a book. The publisher still cut that up into three articles. Yeah. But also that then becomes this fascinating new object that yes. I predicted, I think, 15 years ago that, yeah. that digitisation would allow all sorts of new shapes yes. of books to emerge. Well, the small book, the, the book that's available and works well off, off iBooks, works well off the Kindle platform, mm. fantastic, I think. Mm. And I think that's, again, where Virilio... Uh, has seen the world catch up with him. He's been writing short, short books for years. <laughs> I love them because they're really pithy. Pithy. Pithy, yes. And he's been doing it and we've actually followed. Fantastic. Steve, thank you for this conversation. And I hope for students and for early career researchers that is really useful. Just have another think about the book chapter, eh? Mm -hmm. For more information about the Office of Graduate Research at Flinders University, please refer to www.flinders.edu.au slash graduate dash 